So we're here at the University of Edinburgh today in a Georgetown, Edinburgh um, meeting with just wonderful, diverse, young future leaders of the world from many regions of the world. So it's really, it's glorious for all of us uh, to see this. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, universal health coverage and its link to global health security. And one of the things we began talking about was the idea of, you know, what is security? Uh, and are we just securitizing everything? And if you securitize everything, then it's meaningless. And so um, we tried to define it down to being security, meaning the ability to rapidly um, uh, uh, detect and respond effectively to fast-moving, potentially fast-moving infectious diseases. Um, and we thought that the, the, that the foundation for all of this is um, our, our robust national health systems. But there, there, the definition of that is very muddy. The univer, universal health coverage under the SDGs um, doesn't even include population-based services like surveillance and epidemiology and, and laboratories that you would need for this. Uh, and WHO's definition does include it, but they haven't really operationalized or funded it in any way. Um, and then you have the international health regulations, which do have very specific requirements for core health system capacities, for preparedness, uh, detection, and response. Uh, and we're trying to understand the linkages between all of these uh, and how we can really provide value added um, to WHO and, and national uh, governments about how they can really be effective in not only identifying, in, in, not only in, in having robust health, health systems, but in robustly evaluating them and implementing them. Um, and so we've got the two biggest experts of the world to talk about that. And I mean, Rebecca, did you want to start, you know, perhaps sure. with the evaluation side? Well, I think what's, what, what we're really excited about doing here is um, moving beyond, um, there have been lots of statements about the importance of linking global health security and universal health coverage together. And it seems primarily for political purposes of bringing those things together because they're two important topics in the world at the moment. But what we are trying to do here is really try to get beyond just the statements and think about what is, what is the evidence base for the linkages? Is there a research agenda that we can look to that will support truly defining how, how the two large topics intersect? And are there places where, um, are there certain parts of health security that can be emphasized that are most strongly related to health system strengthening and universal health coverage? Are there other pieces that are kind of on the margins? But how do we start to dig in a little bit on this and, and determine what, what is, what's behind the statements? And another key goal of the workshop was, of course, to bring together scholars to create a community of practice around health security. And the interesting thing about this is it's not one discipline, it's not law, it's not just epidemiology or public health or anthropology, it's all of them together and integrated. Right. Um, and so far, most scholars are working in isolation or working with different governments or different institutions. So if we can create a community um, which will be continued into the future with the large conference Rebecca and Adam are holding, um, then it would be just wonderful to move it forward beyond just policy statements to actually a research agenda where there's evidence to say if you invest in health workers actually it's going to prevent this pandemic if you invest in laboratories actually it's great for also diagnosing whether a child has a bacterial infection or not so in a sense trying to find the evidence to build towards actually say, say the building blocks of uhc the building blocks of age um, health systems strengthening global health security as well as universal health coverage. So hopefully we'll have a productive two days. It is, and, and it's, I love the idea of this kind of community of practice and community of scholars um, that actually can fight for justice and, and, and global health. But the other beautiful thing about it, I think, is that we've got these young people, the future global health leaders of the world, so we're kind of seeding the next generation 
which is really just a lovely thing to see. And I feel very fortunate to be here. Mm. I think that there are definitely areas of synthesis and areas of tension. So I think, you know, universal health coverage is really all about need and it's about providing access to needed healthcare services. And in that sense, I think the two goals are very aligned. Because if you have health systems that are strengthened so that people can access the healthcare they need, they're healthier, you'd also expect investments in health promotion and preventative services and primary health care. These are things that we know um, are going to be very important in um, you know, identifying threats to public health and responding to those threats. Um, UHC, though, is also concerned with financial protection. In other words, you know, providing people with insulation against the costs of needed healthcare services, which they may need to access. Um, and that makes it quite distinctive because it's not just about health, but it's about a sort of broader conception of human welfare, that people need freedom from fear, you know, that, uh, and that people shouldn't incur impoverishing or catastrophic costs just because they need to access health care for themselves or their families. Um, so UHC has financial protection very much at its core. And that means that the sorts of choices you would make about how public resources or donor resources are allocated are probably going to be different if you're pursuing a UHC goal compared to if you're pursuing a global health, uh, a global health security goal. Um, so where you would place money, the kinds of treatments that you would prioritise or the kinds of interventions more generally you would prioritise in a UHC framework are probably going to be different to those that you would prioritise in a global health security framework. So it's somewhere along the line, decision makers need to know which goal they're prioritising, which goal is more important to them. Because if you hold the two goals at the same time simultaneously and try to reach both, then it could be that you give rise to a level of strategic confusion which is not helpful. So I think, you know, purely from the point of view of, a, of trying to generate benefit, most of the things that you would do in order to try and achieve UHC will benefit the goal of global health security. But, you know, the effort that you put in, the workforce that you put in, the financial resources that you put in to achieving universal health coverage, they carry an opportunity cost. Um, so really you want to be looking at net benefits, the benefits net of those costs. Um, and the calculation of those net benefits, I think, will differ depending on whether you're talking about achieving UHC or about health security. And so the two goals will lead to slightly different or possibly very different allocations of resources. So policymakers at the global level and the national level and everything in between, they need to be quite clear, I think, about whether they're prioritizing UHC or global health security. It shouldn't be, they shouldn't be considered as the same goal. As I say, most of the things that benefits one benefit the other. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all the decisions and, and especially resource allocation decisions will be, t will be the same um, between those two objectives. So the topic of universal health coverage and global health security are important on the global agenda. Both can help us promote help for everyone everywhere. But it also raises the questions on where are universal health coverage and uh, global health security similar and where do they differ. We need to understand these concepts and how they play out at the global level um, in the World Health Organization but also on the ground where people are, where patients are, where I as a health worker am. We need to understand where they can gain support so that we can make sure that everyone uh, can live long and healthy lives but that require urgent research and urgent action to make sure that people can live good and long lives. Global health security and universal health coverage are very critical comp concepts that are really advancing human well-being. And I think underpinning these two principles, which are very interrelated, is the need to invest in resilient and sustainable systems for health, both facility and at community level. To that end, I think 
finding very innovative means to fiscally sustain these efforts is critical. I want to make a couple comments. First, um, a couple months ago when um, the um, former president of Liberia, um, President Sirleaf, was um, sitting around a table and talking about what, how the global community needs to approach global health, she made a comment that we need to let the pendulum swing back to the sovereign, give nations more power to determine their future and how they want to structure concepts of security, um, health financing, and justice for their own people, um, and in part kind of renegotiate how financing and support um, is perceived um, at the national level. And I think we're in this critical political moment where we can shift to focus on what people want and what people need. Now, thinking about the national level um, is something that many of my colleagues do very well and have been speaking about today. Um, as an anthropologist, um, I spent a lot of time speaking to people about their healthcare experiences and expectations. And what's lost in this conversation on so many levels, when we're thinking about what does universal health coverage mean from this nation to the next, or what does a global health security agenda mean, is you know what is at what is at what is at risk, but also what is played out in people's lived experiences. I mean, we're talking about people whose stories are so fundamentally overshadowed by these global agendas, and at the heart of all of it is real people's lives. So when I think um, about this woman, Esther, who I interviewed in Nairobi and who my team um, interviewed in Nairobi, is the story that she tells when she has, you know, nursed um, six siblings to their death to HIV, who has lived for 15 years on antiretrovirals um, and now is confronting diabetes. And the narrative she tells is that, you know, I take my antiretrovirals for HIV um, religiously. It's, it's, it's part of my practice of everyday life. This is how I live. But because I have to pay out of pocket for testing, for um, insulin resistance, for diabetes, um, and other kind of crippling problems like depression or arthritis um, or chronic pain, which is a somatization of many types of other social suffering, um, when she has to pay out of pocket, she's most likely going to diverge those funds for her own care to her kids' school fees or her grandchildren's school fees um, or these other competing problems that displace healthcare. So when we're going to think about universal health coverage, we need to also see, you know, what where it when people have user fees. I mean, this goes back to the privatization of healthcare in the 80s from the World Bank. These are things we all talk about, but the implementation of user fees themselves can be transformative for families and be at the center of their decisions. And it's not just user fees, it's bus fees to get to the clinic. So if we're going to think about stuff, staff, systems, space, these complex issues through which we're deciding and deciphering what people need, you know, putting those stories at the center are fundamental. So, you know, if people have these convergent, explicit conditions that are diagnosed or not diagnosed, how do we care for people? How do we put them at the center of the dialogue? So we have to think about risk as, you know, emergence and these global pandemics as much as personal risk um, of putting others before themselves. So what does that mean for a life well lived? So I think there's two key things that donors need to do in the health security agenda. And when I talk about donors, I mean state donors and high income countries rather than other institutions in global health. But I think there's two main roles for them. The first one being uh, financing, because fundamentally low income states do not have the financial capacity to be able to fund either of these activities, either in global health security or uh, universal health coverage without the support of financial support coming from elsewhere. Um, but the other key thing that donors must be doing is offering normative leadership and normative support for actually this is what global health security looks like this is what universal health coverage looks like and I think beyond just setting you know rhetoric and setting policies at the global level they have to lead by example and actually you know take strides themselves to whether it's in global health security you know improving their surveillance and response system mechanisms or whether it's in universal health coverage through you know making sure that they do have whether it's free access to healthcare or whether it is simply 
you know, um, mechanisms in place to make sure that people are uh, free from the threat of um, impoverishment or catastrophic financial um, risk from seeking healthcare. Particularly in global health security, I think international organisations really are leading the way. And these, and I'm not just talking about um, things like the WHO and the global health security agenda, but a number of, of institutions, both state international organisations and um, non-state actors are leading the way in global health security, whether it's through strengthening capacity in countries, whether it's through implementing new programmes, uh, sort of vertical interventions to try and improve health security. Um, it's it's fundamentally important to, to bear these actors in mind because they are the ones who are quite often financing and providing on the ground support to meet health security objectives. In order to understand the alliance between USC and global health security and also the tensions that emerge from this alliance, we need to go back to fundamental questions about how power is distributed in the global health governance landscape, who benefits and at what costs. So if we go back to answering those questions and we know that the global health governance landscape is extremely fragmented and pluralist, um, where large where donors and uh, the global health public-private partnerships or initiatives are funding uh, the low-hanging fruit in global health, uh, largely f uh, focusing on infectious diseases with a particular approach to addressing global health, which is the magic bullet or a silver bullet approach to uh, dispersing uh, vaccines, drugs, and aid. And that completely undermines the uh, importance of what was once the vision, uh, the Almata vision of uh, health systems uh, based on comprehensive primary health care and also addressing simultaneously not only access to health care but the wider social, political, commercial uh, and structural determinants of health. So, to what e so the question is to what extent uh, a global health security framing which is very much linked to the ideas of foreign policy and for, uh, health become being an important foreign policy issue, ideas of bioterrorism uh, and uh, security, uh, national and global security threats. To what extent can we use that as a platform to actually talk about uh, right to health, to, uh, uh, to consider issues around the wider determinants of health and strengthen health systems. So I'm particularly interested in global health and global health ethics and justice. And especially my area of interest and focus is gender. And so I've written a little bit about global commercial surrogacy um, and, and issues around um, clinical trials um, in low-income countries, for example. I'm interested in conceptual analysis of um, issues around exploitation and vulnerability, for example. What brings me to uh, this conference in particular is my interest in global health emergencies. And I'm interested in the ethics around that, particularly how global health emergencies exacerbate existing vulnerabilities and injustices, um, and how our responses might do that as well. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in highlighting uh, areas around injustice that we might want uh, to give our attention to in this field. So I'm interested um, in pandemic responses primarily, but more recently I've become interested in the idea of um, global health governance and, and global health institutions. And I approach this from, from a sort of international law perspective, um, where we have a system or an international legal system which only primarily conceives of the existence of the state and um, the existence of certain international organizations because they are the, the mechanisms through which um, uh, states act. So organizations like the World Health Organization. But what I'm really interested in is the fact that there is an awful lot of power within the global health system that the international legal framework within which global health operates cannot conceive of. So the power of non-governmental organizations or private philanthropic organizations, I'm interested in the, the power these organizations have, particularly the soft power, the sort of influential power which they have over the global health system and how that can be properly regulated and how these actors could cause harm 
uh, and how there can be some form of accountability or responsibility for the harm which these actors cause. That's my sort of main interest and the disconnect between that ideal and the fact that the international legal system cannot really do that. And that sort of relates back to the themes of this this workshop because um, we have this question of whether global health security um, can be pursued uh, or is in conflict um, with the idea of universal health coverage. And I sort of approach this with, well, the pri whether global health security or global health um, universal health coverage is a priority isn't really the choice of a lot of international organizations. It's not really a choice for the World Health Organization. It is a choice for donors who exist within the system without accountability and without responsibility for the power which they, they have. So um, I'm not certain it does link to universal health coverage that well. Uh, but what I can say about it in the context of what I think is global health security um, is related really to animal disease surveillance and I think the fact that animal health and human health are inextricably linked and as a result um, surveillance capacities and veterinary public health infrastructure is really critical in order to be able to afford opportunities for early detection of emerging diseases, novel diseases um, and important animal disease outbreaks that are zoonotic in nature. And then the troubling part of that is that the systems and the capacity that's built up for um, managing what you would call statutory notification of exotic diseases, which is under the regulations, if you like, of the OIE and the Terrestrial and Aquatic Animal Health Code, don't necessarily create a space for those types of zoonotic diseases. And in actual fact, in practice, um, the One Health agenda in, in, in terms of implementation at a national level isn't happening particularly well, in my view, um, uh, in the sense that actually there, it, the animal, uh, zoonotic diseases aren't necessarily covered completely by either one set of regulations or the other, uh, particularly emerging diseases. Um, so they kind of fall under partial, partially under the IHR, for human health and partially under the OIE and there's a bit of flexibility I think um, at a national level as to whether or not you can prioritize these diseases in terms of reporting them um, but fundamentally there's a big gap in that surveillance which causes huge problems um, particularly for the intersection of both. Um, my research is really interested in this concept that global health security and universal health coverage are as I say two sides of the same coin. And um, I began by looking at kind of the background theory behind this and if there's, just to begin with, if there's any evidence of how they interact at all. Um, and I found when I was doing that study that there's actually very little evidence of how this interaction happens um, at a country level. So most of it's theoretical and it says, you know, eventually we'll see this outcome of this interaction once we achieve either one of universal health coverage or health security. Um, and that kind of theoretical perspective isn't particularly helpful when you're looking at how the policies to achieve health security and universal health coverage occur at a country level. Um, so when we were designing the study, we decided that the way to look at it at a country level was to look at disease surveillance and control um, programs and as the lens for global health security at a policy level. So that's mainly through the international health regulations, which have a basis in surveillance and diagnostic program development. So what we've decided to do is look at basically whether the international health regulations um, overlap at all with universal health coverage in a, in a country context, and that's in Bangladesh. Um, and from what I've said at the moment, theoretically they may, but there's also a lot of problems assuming that they'll actually be synergistic in a positive way for either universal health coverage or the international health regulations. Because um, there's quite significant differences between the two frameworks which we do need to recognise and are often overlooked in the current literature. That's, that's kind of how we decided to integrate this notion of disease surveillance and universal health coverage, because obviously they're both very important to the overall health system development, but it's, the real question is how do you integrate them together so that they're synergistically working rather than working parallel. So the question of diagnostic capacity and disease surveillance is actually really interesting to me in the context of Ebola, obviously, because that's why we're talking about this. 
Um, but in Senegal, where I do my research as a medical anthropologist, um, the sort of fear around the spread of Ebola and the, the discourses that it has put into motion are kind of dovetailing with some other questions about the importance of diagnostic capacity, which is actually crucial, um, I think, to universal health coverage. So the reason I say that is because I studied malaria for my uh, doctoral research, and so both the, the global discourse on how we fight malaria and how it was implemented in Senegal. And I was very interested by the fact that the way that you diagnose malaria in most resource poor settings in Senegal is by using rapid diagnostic tests rather than building up the capacity for microscopy in um, in clinics in rural regions. And so you're able to diagnose malaria, but you're not able to diagnose other kinds of febrile illness. And so there's this sort of <clears throat> way that increasing diagnostic capacity, although it focuses so much on infectious disease in that sense, it is actually a process of um, strengthening health systems, of building health systems that can actually address uh, suffering as it exists rather than um, ignoring the problem or thinking we only have simple tools to address the issue. Uh, so disease surveillance and diagnostic capacity are actually important for universal health coverage, but they're not the end solution um, by any means. And so in the context of Senegal, I would say, that um, they help the problem, but there's so much that needs to be done beyond it. Yes, I do think uh, uh, infectious disease surveillance and uh, uh, laboratory capacities will definitely will bring us towards, uh, move us towards universal health coverage. Uh, yes, I do believe that uh, if we have the good surveillance systems and laboratories to support up the surveillances, so that will really help us to track out, uh, track the. Uh, emerging infectious diseases or existing uh, infectious diseases so for the better uh, preparedness and action by the governments so that way it will be very helpful and then my my uh, straight question would be uh, kind of my reservations about this is that so why only uh, infectious diseases uh, if you were to, uh, uh, move, to move towards uh, universal health coverage as I believe that uh, non-communicable diseases are the major contributors of global uh, burden of disease. So we're in uh, 40 plus, 40 percent and more. Um, uh, uh, disease burden is, is with uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. So I think in, uh, in addition to the infectious diseases surveillance, we also need to bring in the non-communicable diseases surveillance and then the laboratory capacities. So I think it's uh, if we can bring these t these two things together, both communicable diseases or infectious diseases as well as the non-communicable diseases, that will definitely will uh, will make a, a, a much impact, and then uh, I think that will be the most comprehensive way and then uh, uh, comprehensive way to move us towards the universal health coverage. And just focusing on infectious diseases and claiming to be the you know, we have we have reached. Uh, we have achieved universal co co health coverage. Perhaps I may not be fully agreeing with that uh, statement. Uh, yeah, I do believe that there should be an integration of NCDs also uh, to make us towards, I mean, to move us towards universal health coverage. So international law can play a very powerful role in enabling both UHC and global health security. It is a way of expressing the will of states, is a very traditional way of looking at it, and so it can be a good way of assessing what is the international community's uh, norms, standards and expectations in global health security and UHC. At the same time, it's also an opportunity, international law is an opportunity for uh, civil society and other interested groups to help advocate for, uh, t for developments, for changes, for improvements in global health security and UHC. Um, international law has the potential to also conflict. The nature of international law is that 
Nowadays, it tends to be developed within sort of particular areas of focus, whether it be international trade law, global health law, human rights law, international environmental law, and that fragmentation can also have an impact on global health security and UHC. So one of the important roles of international law scholars uh, and for those who work within the realm of international law is identifying that fragmentation, finding potential conflicts and seeing if there's a way to resolve those conflicts so that UHC and global health security can be realised. So one of the projects that I work on is uh, you know, looking at these evolving regional health governance in Southeast Asia, where I come from, uh, where, where, where the Philippines is located. And um, in 2015, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nat Nations, uh, launched its uh, regional integration projects, similar to the European Union, but not quite. Um, and so as part of the integration, we expect a greater you know, mobility of goods and services and people. And so there is a much greater level or degree of cooperation uh, among countries of Southeast Asia, 10 countries uh, today. And um, I'm very interested in how um, regional bodies uh, sub-global actors such as ASEAN can help, um, you know, improve health, uh, enhance regional cooperation for health, but in particular address this uh, nexus of universal health coverage and global health security. Uh, interestingly, what I'm seeing now is that there are two parallel streams that are happening uh, in, in Southeast Asia. In terms of UHC, uh, the 10 countries are now on the road to UHC. Uh, there are several um, you know, joint learning exercises and declarations that have been you know, passed or uh, signed by ministers of health in Southeast Asia around this subject. And on the other hand, there are also parallel activities happening in the area of pandemic preparedness, enhancing the capacity of, of countries to address uh, infectious disease outbreaks, et cetera. But uh, right now, there is no uh, convergence uh, between the two yet. Uh, but also the challenge is that the way Southeast Asia or ASEAN was designed is that um, you know, the declarations that, they, that the body uh, passes are not necessarily uh, legally binding. And so there's no teeth, but there's a high degree of commitment among the countries because it's adopting a consensus-based way of decision-making. And so what I can see now is there's some promise towards... Um, you know, mutually reinforcing the two, UHC and global health security. But also there might be some challenges. For instance, one of the papers that I wrote uh, three years ago was on, uh, you know, migrant inclusion in universal health coverage. And as I've mentioned, part of ASEAN integration is, you know, free flow of or mobility of people within the region. And Migration is a very sensitive topic. It can, you know, strike very delicate chords, especially when you talk about, you know, national security. But on the other hand, since Southeast Asia is now, you know, uh, becoming a much more unified region, maybe it's high time to actually, you know, put on the table UHC coverage for migrants, for non-citizens, vis-a-vis the global health security agenda. So these, of course, are developments that are yet to be seen, uh, and I'm excited to uh, witness them uh, in the years to come. <laughs>